And we are returning to tape live in the past. I am your ever eccentric and hopefully engaging host, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. And for any new or hazy of memory listeners, that is a choice. It's not some flippity flappity word I just floped in there. I don't flope, friends. At least not in this universe. Uh, so backstory, explorations, um, for a Wattpad Wednesday podcast release uh, of the collaborative, creative... something with the C, insert word here, process that is the weird world-building widget uh, behind the Zeppoverse brand experience. This is all rough and raw and radically unscripted, genuine, authentic, audio blogging, live for your entertainment. Um, I'm not reading from a teleprompter. I don't have any staff surrounding me with with cue cards or written dialogue. This is me, raw from the heart, sharing with you um, sort of a, a clown sitting at a typewriter in a storefront window at the mall, except it's me on a tape recorder in my workspace at my house. So, today's uh, show, part two of Wattpad Wednesday's preliminary development, Doc Triple Zero. I'm just going to dive right in, folks, and catch you all back up. Anybody, this is all part of the performance, too. And then we're going to grind on a little bit more writing, I do believe. But you'll be pleasantly surprised that in the interim of time between the last recording session and this, um, I added a thing or two. But sort of like how TV shows have previously on, dot, dot, dot. Uh, This audio blog is sort of like review and refine through a repetitious manner. Bonus points to anyone who knows what that definition uh, is. Or rather, what word that definition I just busted out belongs to. Here we go. It's rehearsal. The word rehearsal. Uh, For my own sake, in case I forget, but I doubt that I would. Okay, here we go. Rehearsing the reading of the presumed newest version of the very first page of the very first title of the long, complicated book series, commonly referred to collectively as the Zeppoverse. Original story development note, triple zero. In quotations, or parentheses, no, in quote marks, the problem with origin stories, spelt with a Z. The problem with origin stories is, brackets, see recorded improvisational rough draft notes, and insert here, Addendum yet to be completed. But having referenced all that, I continue. Suffice it to say, it is challenging and quite difficult to know where exactly to begin. Editorial sidebar distraction. I am genuinely laughing at myself for not knowing how to correctly type out the phrase, suffice it to say. I literally thought it was a one-word Phrasing, suffice it, and I tried to spell it like 12 different ways. Missing from text.
<clears throat> okay, let me start over from editorial sidebar. Editorial sidebar distraction. I am genuinely laughing at myself for not knowing how to correctly type out the phrase, quote, suffice it to say, spelt correctly. Literally thought it was one word, suffice it. And I tried to spell it like 12 different ways, each met with the judgmental squiggly line of Spell Checker 10,000 Pro. Needless to say, I am a very strange person. And thus, it should be no surprise to anyone reading this that my origin story is also. Adding missing phraseology. Continuing, the problem specifically with origin stories and Mr. Zeppo is that he has a bazillion of them. <clears throat> Mr. Zeppo, colon, in brackets, interjecting, as in like a stage direction of doing so. Dialogue. Actually, brackets, makes, quote, pushing glasses up a bridge of nose, I am a nerd gesture. Missing typing, I am a nerd. Close brackets, dot, dot, dot. <clears throat> Actually, <clears throat> it's more like a quadruple Googleplex. Character, narrator, colon, in brackets, breaking character and fourth wall. Uh, <clears throat> that's not a real number. Gesticulating wildly, arms in the air, sarcastically in disbelief. Mr. Zeppo, authoritatively, dead in the eye at the narrator. Um, yes, yes it is. In brackets, peers over frame of imaginary glasses. Imaginary and semi-invisible glasses for emphasis, doubling down on the direct eye contact. Brief pause. In brackets, visual notation footnote with character voiceover in Mr. Zeppo's professorial voice, colon. <clears throat> a Googleplex is one followed by a Google of zeros. No relation to the internet search company. It is impossible to write out, but in scientific notation, it looks a lot like 1x101. Little arrow pointy thing. 1000. According to an article from August 5th, 2019, found on the interwebs, how many zeros in a Google? A Googleplex? End footnote. There was a prolonged pause between the two of them, as if they both were considering taking the stage and proceeding with a diatribe railing against the other, or conversely indulging in subjugating each other with the official silent treatment live in front of a bemused audience. Then the tension broke and everything proceeded as planned. Narrator in brackets backing down. Uh, sure, fine. Brackets resuming in narrator voice. Suffice it to say, it's a challenging and quite... It is challenging and quite difficult to know where exactly to begin. The problem, specifically with origin stories and this fool, commonly referred to as Mr. Zeppo, adding missing text, is that he has a bazi... <clears throat> in brackets, correcting himself brusquely 
emoting the hint of sarcastic bunny ears vibe, a quadruple Googleplex of them, and that's quite a lot. Where to begin? Dramatic pause. It's overwhelming, even to him. And he had lived through them all himself. Adding missing text. Is that it? I think that's it. That's what I added. Uh, And now, raw, off the top of my head, improvised continuation of that text. After a brief pause to consume some caffeinated adult... No, regular caffeinated beverage. I I started to say the word adult because I believe coffee should not be consumed by children. And that's a weird thing. And I, I I even hesitate to use the word believe. I have come to the intellectual and, I guess, moral conclusion that if I were raising my own brood of progeny, I would have explicitly explained to them from the earliest of ages that caffeine akin to alcohol and other substances are in our household to be respected until a certain age limit has been reached. Uh, And I say that in all seriousness. As an acknowledged former coffee addict slash enthusiast slash lover slash sharer of coffee memes, uh, and I don't mean to be a coffee culture traitor, (laughs) as I'm sure some have quite uh, curiously accused me of being a traitor to other subcultural identity labels, which I don't even utilize for myself. Um, but uh, and they've been varied in their examples. <laughs> Uh, not the not the least silly of which was a traitor to my own sex and gender, but that's a whole deep dive conversation, folks. That's got nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about here. This is my newest, like fresh off the top of my slow, ponderous, deep thinky vibe development brain, uh, like take on the introduction to the entire project, the the meta Zepoverse. Um, and there's another chapter that I wrote a little bit earlier, or another beat that I wrote a little bit earlier that would be like the intermediate chapter that breaks this up, like the faux chapter that breaks this up, um, which I'll intersperse in just a moment. I want to capture, capture one more blurb. Um, but first, I want to explain like the brackets, just in case anyone's like, what the hell is he talking about? I'm sort of mixing literary conventions typographically. When I, if and or when I uh, officially, professionally publish this or any Zeppoverse brand book title, it will, to some degree or another, um, although I imagine I'll strive to achieve some like polemic endpoint example of both the most normative of literary presentation format traditions and the most wildly experimental. But throughout the series, um, all of them will literally experiment in the style of, or, and beyond, because I'll be, I mean, I'm doing things I don't think they did over there in this thing I'm about to reference, but the house of leaves. And I mean no infringement. And that's a massive asterisk slash, red pin on the corkboard of many things to take note of about my Zeppoverse projects, which are applicable throughout in the art, in the in the podcast, in the self like produced bootstrapped literary experiment that I'm conducting uh, vis-a-vis the crossover experience of reading the pages on Wattpad and listening to the podcast episodes about it uh, and that's that thing that pin on the corkboard is that that uh, insert whatever I was just referencing here because it just popped out of my mind and I don't have time to try to struggle with the memory bubble gap issue uh, to recapture it. Um, but back to this this original content that I've been 
reading from, minus the little actual little literal blurb from the soup of all information available digitally in, in the world. Brackets represent, like, theater-style stage direction. That's the thread I almost lost. And I mean them genuinely, as if I, I, I want to be able to, hopefully, successfully, drag any reader's imagination through the experience that starts like the familiar getting lost and caught up in your own mind as you read a book experience and sort of experimentally, consciously invoke and hopefully successfully help facilitate their own original imaginational conceptualization and and holographic re-representation of various theatrical kind of experiences um, by invoking a sort of structural uh, t- meta-textual uh, print graphic imagination gameplay uh I believe in the imaginational theater of the mind. The imaginariatation. I'm trying to coin a really cool original... Um, I, need to, I need to dig up some Latin words that either sound like imagination or are literally related to imagination. Put a new pin on the court board because I don't think I've ever, ever pinned that idea to the board yet. And I need to do that with a bunch of words. And then, of course, you know, be some snarky. And then I need to do the research about, like if there are such words in other languages of importance like Aramaic and whatnot. Uh, But I'm a big believer language research weirdness aside I'm a big believer in the power of the visualization of words on text by the mind by those who enjoy especially those who are enthusiastic book readers right? And, uh, and to tinker with it the way some books have, you know, vis-a-vis other authors is... How do you pluralize and possessivize that? Multiple authors, possessive S. Um, techniques and examples uh, for what is art but standing on each other's shoulders with newer and newer ideas about the same old things, right? I want to sort of hijack the imagination generator image generator by giving it like direct imagination prompts uh, and borrowing a thing that works for me which is the, the theatrical the theatrical stage notation especially from examples of my own tinkering with it for my own theatrical projects i.e individual or partnered scene study projects running the you know, gambit all the way to like you know the, the handful of shows that I've self-produced in various venues various times through various reasons um, throughout my my tenure as a practicing theater experimenter and by mixing and matching and, and you know hopefully finding my own recipe, evoke off the page a really vivid and lucid experience that includes imagining characters on stage in a very intuitive fashion, even if you've never gone to the theater very much. It being sort of this thoroughly successful in surviving, but yet sort of often um, inaccessible uh, to too many a sort of phenomena, this this cultural pillar of our society that, that often goes popularly neglected, for which, and in favor of which, and in great support of, I am uh, a great advocate in terms of my willingness to say so in public, that it, if you've never gone to the theater, it is part of your civic duty to go and find a theater whose art actually engages you and if, if you're the kind of person that can afford it increasingly of which that becomes fewer and fewer people in the world but that's neither here nor there 
let us create a bit of mind theater together, friends, um, and allow me to just sort of passively engaging your imaginarium center, which whether or not you realize you have deep in the, the core of all of your mental activities, there is this generator of holographic fractal imagery that your mind's eye then consumes. And I'm not trying to do anything weird or toxic or inappropriate to it, but rather entertain you with a um, novel, novelization um, experience, right? So what would happen next? I would have to transcribe everything I just said and insert here. And bracket. And now we've recursively connected two mediums in a way that'll be like interestingly weird, um, both over time and cumulatively, I think. Uh, especially when the full Monty, as, as, as it could be called, finally sort of drops. And, um, and instead of talking about building a world collaboratively like a monkey in a cage or a monkey on a leash with an organ grinder you know, dance, tap dancing for quarters uh, in front of you at the subway station uh, you know, it's finally a book you can buy from whatever book vendors you vendor your books from but slowly but surely it gets cobbled together friends, um, what would the narrator say next if I was in a room, if I was in like if I could do this the way I wanted to do this when I first conceived of the idea like 20 million years ago, I would be in, in it would be a tour of prominent cities with big um, downtown areas where there's a lot there's still a lot of safe foot traffic or even dangerous foot traffic and I would bring about my either my own uh, mechanisms like I'm big vision uh, big picture visioning like this meta image because I want to pause. The writer pauses and reflects. Insert transcription here. And by transcription is like I'm about what I'm about to write. Hold on, let me. And transcription. Spell cor correctly. Yay. Colon. Where are we? We are at 2308, 2308 on the audio tape, part two. Okay, because um, barring a, a lightning fast, as I was starting out part one, barring a, having access to a lightning fast voice to text thing, uh, but imagine, join me in imagining, if you will, stop rambling about my my deficiencies and just enjoin you to imagine the following scene and let's just plop it somewhere in the theater district of London to make it a little exotic I was going to say New York City uh, but imagine a tour date that includes New York City London and Rome and Seoul Korea and whatever the largest city in Japan is and a handful of others, right? So now you've got a city that maybe your capital city, wherever you're sitting in, you know, if your capital city is DC or end of list of capital cities <laughs> from off the top of my head. Um, is it Sydney? Is Sydney's not the capital though, is it? I would want to do the, okay, how's about this? If, if this were no holds barred, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo was already a bazillionaire, it would be a tour of every free and open and welcoming and safe to, to perform in uh, nation state's capital and largest city. And I would bring for myself the capacity to bring a uh, a sort of false storefront window box 
stage system that I could, with all the proper and appropriate licensing required from every city uh, in every nation that I would I would do the tour in. Um, and, you know, of course, adjusting and providing for, like, a, a boardwalk. Like, I can totally imagine it in New York. They would just, like, it would be, they would slap up some, a lot of that um, uh, uh, pipe, if, uh, it would, not fencing, but uh, not girding. What do you call that stuff? Scaffolding, right? But I would create a boardwalk so that it would be, in like, into the street a little bit. And I'd pay for whatever it would cost in a perfect movie setting world so that I could create and without destruct, you know, disrupting whatever natural, uh, visage or storefront of any theater or, uh, building that I care to do this in, but I would probably do it in affiliation with like a major professional theater as well as any like local regional, uh, uh what are they called? Um, Nonprofit theaters, and as well as, uh, not to ignore you know, the third tier C team, which is not a fair thing, because a lot of the, the storefront amateurs are often on par with anything you got going on regionally and professionally, uh, regardless of state or nation. Because there's talent everywhere, folks. There's talent everywhere, and sometimes it doesn't get to see the light of day. But I collect my thoughts again. So that's the epic level, right? And now imagine with your mind. This beautiful storefront thing that is, by permit and allowance, a stage in and of itself. So there's no there's no free there's no driving traffic. I buy out the block, make sure that all the f- traffic is safely rerouted. So it's all like festival for the whatever one block in front of whatever which building I picked. It's all festival atmosphere foot traffic, and I would encourage it to be safe and secure. Um, and in front of the say next to the entrance to insert the name of some famous theater from some what a, one of the many cities on this list here uh, or in the building right next to it if there's not quite enough room or whatever maybe utilizing the, the gap in the alley there unless it's prohibited by necessities of adjunct businesses I create the faux storefront um, like glass fish tank giant you know floor to ceiling display case right and it looks like a legit like there's mannequins and there's there's like you know what's the name of that shopping boulevard like Rodeo Drive in California or uh, I forget the one in New York and then there's another one in London too man names are not dropping insert all the names of the correct boulevards of shopping the only other one I remember is like Third Street Promenade Santa Monica in Los Angeles. And then, of course, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles. But the New York one and the London one, I forget. And, of course, there's many more. Every every big city probably has one. And uh, But it's totally sort of its own self-contained thing that's just got enough set dressing to look like it's been recently added on like as a legitimate construction. And people can walk all around it and all up to it and... You know, um, basically what you're looking at is one of those, uh, you know, boxes when it's it's sort of like a work from home professional computer uh, live streaming slash, you know, writing station, art station. Like it's all big. It's big. And you, there's literally a desk where there's like a computers and stuff and there's, you know, monitors and video. It's all high tech. And then there's a corner or an, an extreme sort of opposed to that end where it gets super low tech. And it's literally just like this ancient and awesome looking typewriter on a perfect, simple, clutter free desk with like a th- massive thing of paper and a bin for all the pages that don't survive. Right. Like, retro flashback to, like, tick-a-tack, tick a you know, insert your favorite writer from Americana of the 20s or something. And, um, but it's all, you, there's mannequins everywhere, but instead of it them being mannequins, they're actually live stage performers, and they sit there and do that sort of mind boggly magical performance of like statue posing and freezing mid-action 
But there's one of them is also literally working. They're all working, actually, to give you some insight into the way the whole thing would work. Um, there's multiple stations, um, and whether there's three or four or ten of them, and it would ebb and flow to sort of have like a, a weird dance-like rhythm to it. Like there's different numbers, and it's all performance art, but it's also art making. You know how you'll go to a, a, an auction and there'll be a live band and a, a painter painting in, and sometimes, you know, dancing to the music and just being artsy? Well, imagine a, a big giant stage of a window storefront uh, display case box. I don't know, 15 feet wide by like seven or eight feet deep, maybe in a sort of hexagonal shape so it has depth and width and like wings on the side um, that so that it looks like like it's built in and where it could if I could get into some access into the like if I'm in front of a warehouse and I can actually do it right in front of a big rolling door I would cheat and be like boom here's a backstage area which can be useful and exposed and be seen by the audience um, and it would be all super flexible and adaptable to the the venue-specific model of, like, when we do it in this city, we totally adapt it so it looks awesome and spectacular in this building fitting this way. When we do it in the other city, you catch on. Now, the gimmick is, the real visual gimmick, is, like, the first time you see it, imagine yourself, you come around a corner, and you're like, oh, snap, there's some kind of festival going on because, there's a, like, the, the street is cut off, there's, you know, safety guards and security. It's all free. You come in and there's, like, free snacks. What do you what do you like? You got, like, caramel corn, blah, blah, blah. It's all free. And it's all being sponsored by, you know, local hometown businesses. And, in, and there is a fundraiser gimmick to it so that it's benefiting local fundraising, you know, uh, needs and... And charitable, in, you know, causes in your local proximity, or in whichever place we go to. And as you, as you sort of realize, imagine I'm guiding you through it, or imagine you and I was walking you there. There you go. And we're friends, and I, and you've come to visit me here in this city. And we're chit-chatting along, and we're, I've told you to just trust me and come with to this thing that's happening in town. And we sort of wander through to the center of the block and we realize that, you know, obviously to one side is sort of a, a row of restaurants, right? So pick, take your pick. There's a little a row of local restaurants. And on the other side is clearly entertainment venues and dead center. Center stage is this giant performance fishbowl of a epic dollhouse shopping display case with a scene inside as I've been describing with, that sort of feels cozy and like it's part mad science laboratory part you know whoever th is doing this is like their man cave at home uh, and all of these different stations and there's a whole performance rotation of different expressive uh, routines that build and climax and, and the thing that ties it all together is that we're experiencing the writing of the next chapter or the next title in the book series um, that is the Zeppoverse brand. And at some point, like a hush falls around the crowd and everyone gathers in front of this crystal box that's, that's dead center in the block and kind of taking up attention space and now like the whole block you know how they do it's certain theme parks when they do you know the big parades and the production numbers they can take down the lighting of all the star fronts and the whole park can just sort of go dark that kind of thing happens and an epic swell of music builds and um a a music soundtrack that begins um, to play starts to like fill the whole street and uh, in the crystal box you, all the other performers however many it built to have reached a sort of denouement of gesture 
And there's like this ten- attenuating moment, and they exit silently, so that suddenly there's just one of them. And whatever sort of fake visage or mask they were wearing on the, because these would be all mask performers, if I hadn't given you that correct impression yet, you should make sure to, in some future updrafting, uh, to incorporate that word earlier on, that they are masked performers so that they genuinely look like um, wooden-faced, still expressionless, almost featureless mannequins. Still very approachable, you know, familiar, not creepy, kind of cool and groovy, non-threatening. And, um... They... Exuant stage left and right with a sort of climax in the musics and a sort of building and sculpting of the lights so that all eyes are drawn to dead center stage right up against the glass. There's lights and lighting production happening outside of the glass, sort of from overhead in like hidden spaces where you just, the audience sort of didn't, didn't realize there was. Um, and maybe there's a bit of a reveal where some some previously covered up or in other ways, you know, visually hidden lighting features become activated. You know, maybe in safety per, uh, uh, safety cordoned off areas, whole massive lighting trees, you know, come telescoping out of the ground um, or out of the sides of the building or out of the sides of um, backup or generic sort of uh, uh, trailer cars that sort of serve to define the 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 blocked off safety cordon or perimeter uh, of the street performance space, etc. And suddenly, everyone that's there is you know in an outdoor amphitheater setting with you know two thousand plus lighting units and super high def surround sound uh, system like very discreetly deployed so you never noticed it and then bam it looked like a plain old regular street but it's it's highly evolved street theater with like hologram projection and secret hidden away uh, you know compartmentalized stage production you know trach uh, trade secret tricks of the trade mechanisms and hideaways and false fronts and uh, interesting things so that theater magic can truly be um, engaged in and in you know sort of delight and awe uh, everyone from 9 to 99 with the sort of oohs and ahs of like surprising you with the theatricality of it and I would love to reference, um, without uh, infringing any uh, rights at all, but um, I had the honor and the privilege uh, and the very, very, very good fortune once of working production crew as a follow spot operator for a Shakespeare show production that was directed, co directed um, by. Uh, magic performance genius teller of the infamous Penn and Teller team duo and uh, the simplicity and elegance that was that was deployed there created some mind-boggling illusions of pure amazement and without revealing any any of those trade secrets, I just want to acknowledge and say that it was a powerful experience to work that show and to be in the presence of not just um, this well, you know, this internationally respected magician for the sheer sake of being that person and, and being in their presence and getting to watch you know, the brilliance be worked out, but the team the, the complete team uh, that was involved each individual brought like mind-boggling talent and I saw some epically beautiful uh, theater magic 
that was beyond you know it was more than just magic magic it was theater magic and there was brilliant magic magic that was that that even though even knowing how the trick worked because I had to sit there and watch rehearsals I I didn't understand it and it blew my mind um and that you know subsequently in the many years since that delightful um incident in which I got to work that show uh uh and may I and I will always for the for and I have been deeply grateful for that uh, and will be for the rest of my life. Uh, but it has inspired my own mind to to engineer and experiment and contrive my own formulations, uh, which will be preserved herein. Which is just to say, um, as a footnote and a, as a disclaimer, um, I will I have been vaguely referencing such machinery or theatrical machinations uh, but I will actually literally describe some of them um, both directly and indirectly for the purposes of my own literary fictional work Uh, and so in that way Uh, and to that end, calling attention in a sort of meta-referential way, the singular the singular totem pole character that you find uh, left in that chrysalis box uh, of a storefront faux facade stage setting, magically steps through what you thought was a solid pane of glass this entire time, which you believe to be a solid pane of glass because you've seen people walk up to it and like pound on it and little kids smash their face up against it because of the performative pre-show that had been going on for the last 45 minutes involving all the various mannequins and whatnot. This character, a mannequin, right before your very eyes, in a way that that should, by all natural means explainable, not be possible, removes the artifice, the mechanism that they are wearing, the costumery, which gives them the appearance of a wooden, slightly larger than life, window closed display mannequin and beneath that is a semi-translucent see-through wireframe robot and it pauses before the audience and scans the width and breadth of it. Now, during that transition, quite discreetly, chairs appeared throughout the space in ways that were sneaky and quite quiet and cleverly disguised in the... uh, seemingly unrelated street carnival, street festival accoutrement spread about the open space that once was the full expanse of this city block. And the uh, host uh, quite humbly encourages everyone to make themselves comfortable by taking a seat. This robot now sort of occupying the dead center lollipop circle at the center of a extended thrust stage that platforms out from the front of the shopping glass Uh, window facade he takes a a humble little bow and sits as though having a chair 
But being a little animatronic robot, he's sitting on nothing more than air. The music dies down, and there's a brief period where this tangle of wires and cables that you can otherwise see straight through to the people opposite you, uh, and yet seems to be a animated and quite agile puppet of sorts. Breathes in a deep breath, for lack of a better description, being made of just a jumble of wires, but it, you know, shapes the, the, the quite recognizable silhouette of an otherwise very person-looking-like image. And this animatronic entertainment robot host proceeds to introduce to you the story of a novelist that could not write and a trans-dimensional being that could not do anything right. Lights, blackout, the little animatronic doll at the center of that stage thrust disappears and inside the storefront display case sitting dejectedly at the typewriter is a very real, very fleshy looking human individual of approximately 22 or 23 or 24 years of age rugged, mature looking disheveled and perhaps a little distraught frustrated even but diligently and persistently attempting to carry on